Welcome to our show tonight. This is Polygamy, What Love Is This? And my name is Doris Hansen, and I'm the host uh, for the program. Very grateful to be able to do so. And tonight just happens to be uh, the first show beginning our sixth year of broadcasting here, Polygamy, What Love Is This? on KTMW TV 20, Salt Lake City. And we're so grateful for this television station that has been so faithful to provide Christian programming. And we find it rather ironic that the first show of our sixth year actually features interviews with escapees from the Kingston Polygamy Group, the group that I was born and raised in, and escaped from. And we certainly don't, didn't plan it this way, but we wonder if this is God's poetic justice. We are going to be uh, interviewing a couple of, of ladies from the Kingston Polygamy Group tonight, but I would like to uh, let you know of some websites that you can go to to find information out about the Kingston Group. Uh, the links are good links, and you'll find out a lot of good information. The first one is www.rickross.com. You can go there and find a lot of information and news articles on the past dealings with the Kingston Group. And also there is uh, wikipedia.org uh, uh, or wiki Latter-day um, of Christ. And of course, you can write that down off the screen. We'll cover some of that information tonight, uh, but there's a lot more there that we won't be able to cover. As I already mentioned, I was born and raised in the Kingston Polygamy Group. And the Kingston Group is also known as, and it was, first began called the Davis County Cooperative Society. That was its original and legal name. And it is sometimes called Co-op for short of the Cooperative Society. Sometimes it's called the Order, and you may hear us referring to it as the Order tonight during our discussion. And that, of course, is short for the United Order, as invented by Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. And it's also called the Latter-day Church of Christ, which is its religious name. And then, of course, it's been nicknamed the Kingston Clan. The group was founded in, uh, in Bountiful, Utah. It has business ownerships and members living in various locations throughout Utah, as well as several other states in the Intermountain West. And to most polygamy group <clears throat> members, their controlling force is their religion and their leadership. Nothing or no one is more important than their religion and their faithfulness to the group. This could also be said of the Kingston group. Nearly everything they do is determined by what the group leader calls direction from God. It covers such things as when a marriage will occur, who the marriage partner will be, education, even dietary requirements. The group was founded in 1935 by Eldon Kingston, and we have some pictures of the leadership that we'd like to put up on the screen. Eldon Kingston was the founder of the group, and when he died, his brother, Ortel, John Ortel Kingston, became the leader. And when he died, his son, Paul Kingston, became the leader and is the current leader of the Kingston Polygamy Group. This group is highly secretive. As children, we were warned and threatened against ever talking to anyone outside of the group, telling what went on inside the group. We were cautioned and counseled what to say and what not to say to anyone who inquired about our personal and home life. The ultimate threat that they always relied upon was if we failed to be compliant, we were doomed to eternal damnation into the deepest depths of hell, becoming a son of perdition, which was worse than the devil. Because of the fear implanted into the child's mind, top secrecy continues to be maintained in the Kingston polygamy group while, while, while they keep a peaceful and, and compliant facade to the public. Tonight, we have the privilege of interviewing two very lovely and lively young ladies who have left the Kingston Polygamy Group for various reasons and have been able to make a new life for themselves outside of polygamy. It's very courageous of these women to agree to talk about some painful experiences and to discuss the very things that they were warned against talking about as they grew up inside polygamy. So to get into a very interesting, revealing, and sometimes heart-wrenching program, let me introduce our special guests. <clears throat> First, I would like to introduce Nicole. She was born and raised in the Kingston group, as we mentioned, and she left the group. And believe it or not, Nicole is now living happily outside the group, and she's happily married. Welcome to the show, Nicole. 
Thank you. Thank you for having the courage to come and talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're, you're more than welcome for that. <laughs> and next, I would like to introduce Jessica Christensen. After trying to run away from her polygamist home and family three times, beginning at the age of eight years old, she finally made it out safely and permanently. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you. <laughs> welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you for coming. We have an interesting conversation that we have <laughs> planned for tonight. I'm going to ask you questions and, and just answer them, you know, how you feel comfortable doing it. And most of the questions I'm going to ask you will be, uh, both of you will be able to answer. Sometimes I'll directly ask a question where you both won't need to answer. But uh, for the most part, just just let's just talk about your life in the Kingston group. But briefly, first of all, <clears throat> tell us when you left and... How old you are when you left, when you got out? Uh, I actually, it actually took me a couple times to leave. Um, I tried for the first time when I was 17 and lived in my car for a little bit. Wow. And then moved in with somebody from the outside of the community just because I had, I wasn't 18, so I wasn't able to get an apartment or anything. Yeah. And then they threatened me and I went back and then I left again permanently when I was 19. Wow, so you, you, you were 17 and you, how long did you live in your car? Um, about a month, month and a half. Really? It was, was this summer or winter? <laughs> uh, spring. <laughs> Springtime. So it wasn't that, it could have been worse, let's it, put it like it that, but worse. that isn't good. Okay, and um, what about yourself? How old were you? And Well, like you mentioned before, eight is the first time I was that I remember telling on my parents and telling about, you know, some of the abuse and neglect that was going on. And the don't know exactly what happened on the state side of things, but somehow at one point we got sent home, sent back to our home after being in foster care for a while. Mm -hmm. And so we were in back in my parents' care and I, Halloween night, 2001, 2001, I ran away because I knew that they weren't going to be looking for me at least till 11 p.m. at night, so mm -hmm. I had time to get away. Mm -hmm. So I ran away Halloween night, and I was in state's custody for, I was home, sent back home by judge. Sent back home again. Yep, by, by Thanksgiving. And wow. then um, at this point, they were really trying to help me want to stay. They were offering me, you know, some good things like a husband or whatever. And <laughs> <laughs> in their mind. <laughs> yeah, in their mind. <laughs> and, um... That was pursuing, and honestly, it kind of was working because I didn't want to leave when the next event happened. It just by a series of events, by default, just happened. Uh -huh. And so um, by the next time, I got my ears first, and my dad was threatening to pull them out, and I was like, well, I'm getting married. I don't belong to you. And I asked my husband, the person that's going to be my husband, and he was okay with it. So I'm out, you know, mm -hmm. and I just took off running. Wow. And my dad started chasing me, and I was just going to walk away and just walk like walk down the street and just go like walk away but when he started chasing me then i ran into a gas station and i hid and that gas station lady never seen her since but she made a huge difference in my life and she called the cops she you know kind of figured out what building i came from knew that it was a polygamous building and she took the initiative to step up and do something and from there everything just started rolling and because of my previous mm -hmm. cases people would have been like We've seen you before. What's going on? Like, yeah. why are you keep coming back in the system? So it seems like the the, the normal procedure. In fact, I think that that their their uh, the state's uh, platform is if some teenager, if someone leaves a polygamy group, the they their whole purpose is to bring you back to make sure that they can restore the family. The state's purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the state does have a. They want to preserve the family. Even though it's polygamist, mm -hmm. even though basically because the they're one... trying to not discriminate against polygamy, which I mean they should, but <laughs> well they should because it is against yeah. the law. <laughs> and then polygamists cry religion, religion, yeah. freedom of religion. Yeah. So they're yeah. kind of in a tough spot. But I'm thankful for it working out the way it did for me. Okay. <laughs> were there st care scare tactics that were used against you before you made the choice to leave while you were growing up? What kind of scare tactics did they use? to keep you from wanting to leave? The biggest thing for me that made me stay for so long is because they threatened to take my siblings and I, I, I stayed to protect them. They threatened 
to have, never have any contact with them again. Mm -hmm. They threatened eternal damnation, but I didn't care. Mm -hmm. I was already in hell. Yeah. <laughs> That's just what I thought when I was there. Same thing. Yeah. Hell wasn't, it couldn't so, be that much worse, right? <laughs> so it was basically shunning yeah. and, and, uh, and hell. And is that the true with you? Yeah, actually, after I ran away in the 2001, when I got sent back, then a lot of people spit at me when I was walking at church. I got snowballs, rocks, things thrown at me. I'd have some oh. of my friends, they would um, be walking by me and they would get things tossed at us or spit, a, spit at, just things like that. And I was like, oh, it's me they're doing it to. So if you want to walk over there, and we would literally be like a few, couple feet apart so that they could be protected from all of it. But no, they literally treated me like crap. And so mm -hmm. I was really worried about this in 2004, yeah. when I was 15, I was worried about if I got sent back by the judge again, what would happen and who would I have become? Yeah. But I would have lost my whole family. I did lose my whole family. Had to re rebuild from the ground up with my whole family. And mm -hmm. um, they, you know, like she said, I would have gone to hell, sons of perdition. And I actually just got to a point where I decided I would rather be in hell with everybody else than in heaven with them because mm -hmm. everyone else looked like they were fine and I just, yeah. That's, that's exactly <laughs> what went through my mind when I made the choice to leave. This is hell and I, it can't be any worse. I'll, I'll, I'll at least live a life here before <laughs> eternal hell. How many wives does your father have? You both have different fathers. How many wives does your father have and how many siblings do you have? Mm. My father has 27 wives and I have over 200 siblings. Each. Over 200? Yeah. <laughs> well, 27 wives times yeah. 12 each wife. <laughs> we have to catch Someone our breath on this one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and what about you? My father has 14 wives, and I know I'm the 25th kid because I did the, like one time <laughs> mapped the it out. Up. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like the 25th kid, but I think that he's somewhere between 150 to 200 currently. Oh my goodness. But, and that's alive because he's had a lot of kids that have not like lived. That, and that, that would be the same. Yeah. So, so the the over two hundred are living children, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, one hundred and fifty to two hundred living brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! <laughs> How did your your mothers and your siblings react immediately after you left? I mean, was it dead silence? Were they were were they not? Did they want to contact you, or did they did and, and didn't dare, or they didn't did they not want to contact you? Um. It depends on the kids and it depends on how close the relationship was before I left and how I handled it after I left. With my mom, then she kept a relationship as long as she thought that I would come back. And then once she realized that I wasn't coming back, then it was it was done with her. Mm. She still, I mean, she would still call me and tell me happy birthday or usually a text. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah, she... she yeah, she did make an effort for there, a little while. There are some that can't even do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, are you on good? Are you on better terms with her now? On more, or is it still pretty shunning? Um, it's it's definitely shunning. It's still shunning. She, I feel like sometimes she wants to make an effort, but she's afraid of what will happen. She probably doesn't dare. Yeah, yeah. my brothers and sisters still will try to contact it. I mean, it depends on. Yeah. yeah, it depends on the situation, but they do want contact, and they do, they do try to call me, and they will try to set up time yeah, to meet. That's good. So. That's good. That's encouraging. Uh, how about you? Well, of course, it was a different <laughs> circumstance. Different story, certainly. Um, in state's custody, then par my parents fought for me. Mm -hmm. They um, they asked me the night before they were supposed to deliver me to the police or whatever for their restraining order. They asked me if they wanted me if they wanted me, or if I wanted them to fight for me. And of course, I'm sitting there like, mm -hmm. of course I'm gonna say yes. I don't really feel like I had another option to say anything else. So I was mm -hmm. like, yeah. And so I was like, okay, all along the way, I'm going to pretend I wanna come home. <laughs> and I'm going to, you know, try to like ride the line because I've been sent home twice already, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So I had no idea what was gonna happen. Plus, I did wanna go home to my mom I did not want to go home to Daniel, and so I kept thinking in my little mind that somehow magic was going to happen and that was going to work out. And I had this hope that my mom would choose me and my siblings over her husband. Mm -hmm. And so that connection, the state broke off my connection with my mom. Like, you know, very much everybody in the order, the group was really sad and was like, the state took us away. Like, mm -hmm. in their mind, we didn't run away. And, um, 
So it, we, I wasn't allowed to have contact with her, really. And we tried to have contact. The state even broke her contact with the order, trying to, you know, help so that she can become independent. Mm -hmm. And it just got to a point where it was just such a mess that, yeah. um, and it drew, was drawing out past the year and just past the year mark. So when I was 16 is when I just said, you know what, my mom's not choosing me. It's time for me to find a new future. And mm. that's when I just turned yeah. around. And with the yeah. education I learned in foster care. Certainly that makes a lot of difference, yeah. doesn't it? Education is a big answer to this problem. Huge. <laughs> I want to ask you a question. Are there mothers, do you believe there are mothers inside the group who have suffered tremendously with this lifestyle of polygamy and, and with neglect from their husbands? Do you believe that there are any who have, who have seen their daughters grow up and would rather their daughters not suffer what they suffered and maybe try and help them leave or wish they could help them leave and not have to suffer what she suffered? I would like to believe <laughs> that those mothers exist. You know, we all have the hope that one day we're going to grow up and Prince Charming is going to rescue us or our mother. But... Um, I personally don't know of anybody whose mother was doing that. Whose mother has helped. What about and you? And by then, I usually think that the mothers are just emotionally dead. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to help. They don't know how to help even if they wanted. Mm -hmm. That's and probably fear. I think because with me, then I know with my mom, then even, I mean, from a young age, then the mom has to stand back while the father's abusive. And I think after watching that for so many years and then seeing their daughters grow up, they're, they're to the point where they're just, it's something that's going to happen. The abuse that they watched their daughter's it, whole life. It's just going to be there. It's just going to happen. It's and just life, huh? There's really nothing they can do about it. Would you say that most of the parents are guilty of failure to protect their children? Absolutely. If not being the one to hurt them in the first mm -hmm. place. But yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And we talked about shunning, and uh, most false religions do practice the shunning process when someone leaves and, and turn and believes differently. Um, I always wondered what it would have been like to have had a mother, and this is, goes on with what you guys were just saying, <laughs> that would have shield me and protect me and defend me. I, I always wanted to, her to do that, and she never did. She, it never happened. It seemed like that she was always against me and was often not even very nice to me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, uh, I've read books like Escape by Carol and Jessup and, and others who have left other groups, and they would see their daughters being getting old enough uh, mm -hmm. to where they were going to be put in the same position and get so desperate to protect their daughters, they would actually do everything they could to get out so their daughters wouldn't have to go through that. And that's why I was wondering if you've ever seen that happen in the Kingston group. So you were handled, handed a guilt trip after you left. We talked about the guilt trip <laughs> to keep you from leaving. And now that you're gone, what kind of a guilt trip have they placed on you? It comes from everywhere. In fact, they've even brainwashed my siblings to some point to think that it was my fault. That I'm the one that broke up our whole family because I left. And... It's taken a lot of years and a lot of sticking by hearing very hurtful things to teach my siblings that, no, I didn't abandon you. I'm still here. You can call me at any time. Yes. But they, it's them that are keeping our family apart. I mean, if they would let me come home and see you guys every week, I would absolutely, I would be there. But it's not possible because every time I go there, then they call the cops on me. And that gets old really quick. <laughs> Is that right? So you, you were taught the Articles of Faith, the Mormon Articles of Faith, right? Yes. We were, we were taught. And isn't one of those Articles of Faith that we have the right to believe however we want and that we yeah, give the right to others? That's not what others? I was taught. Um, <laughs> it isn't necessarily true. I don't know. I have my Bible with me. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What kind of guilt trips have they placed on you after you're out? Well, so after I officially made the choice to for sure leave and to not go home, then um, I was just in a public high school goofing off with some kid and he just like shoved me like while we were going down the stairs and I tripped and fell and I shattered one knee and I broke the other foot so I was in a wheelchair and Heidi or well my mother <laughs> she saw me and she just came up and she was just like you know why this happened don't you and I knew exactly what she was saying she was saying you left the church you left the order so now you're being punished Mm -hmm. The other thing they teach you is that LaDonna, which was Ortel's wife, mm -hmm. so she put this 
like she had this dream, which is how they get all their visionaries mm -hmm. or how God speaks to them. So she had this dream that anybody who leaves is going to have black blood. They really care about the blood. So if you leave, you're somehow black blood's going to come in your family. Like you're going to marry it. You're going to have black children. And the sad thing is, a lot of people have. But what's wrong with that? You know, like there's nothing wrong with someone being black. I don't know why they they've somehow gotten confused. Oh, they're very very yeah. traditional. That goes clear back to the beginnings of Mormonism. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other one is that you're you will be cursed as a woman. You will be cursed your, to have children. Either you will not be able to have children, you'll become completely infertile, oh. or when you do have children, then um, you'll have like hardships in your pregnancies. Mm -hmm. So it's constant. Like I am sure for you that little things happening, you're like, okay, is this bad thing happening because I made, I left the order, or is this happening because crap happens to people? Well, what happens <laughs> when what happens when those kinds of things happen to people inside the group? Because it's they're God's not test. But with you, well, it's, God's, it's, it's, God's it's, it's God's curse. You know what? God doesn't do things like that. Do you know that? Do you yeah. know so God I'm, does I've not that hurt now. people? I've learned that now through being a parent. But in the order specifically, <laughs> Daniel, well, these are in the news. But Daniel went to jail and David went to jail, both about 1999 to 2000. Mm -hmm. They're like numbered men. So they're considered, um, they're considered like high up in the group. Mm -hmm. They don't sin, I guess. So <laughs> when they went to jail, we were told in church that they were in jail suffering our sins. Oh, that yes. we needed to be good. Okay. So it's like if they, mm -hmm. if bad things happen to them, we're sinning. Bad oh. things happen to us, we're sinning. Oh boy, that's you just can't win. <laughs> that's a horrible twist. My mother told me that my grandpa died because of my sins. But you know what? The only person who pays for sins <laughs> is Jesus. We either pay for our own sins yeah. in hell, or Jesus paid for them on the cross. So don't ever let people tell you that again. Because I that definitely just isn't had to true. relearn a new relationship with Heavenly Father because through having my own children, I've realized. If I can love my children this much, and Heavenly Father's love is way more Absolutely than mine. Absolutely right. So he, and like, and I can forgive my daughter for anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, he can forgive me. And God can we'll figure forgive. it out. And God doesn't <laughs> hurt people. God does not hurt people like that. The devil hurts people. Yeah. But, and then there's just accidents. Life happens, right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, God. Now, when you left, what did you have to learn to do after you left? Like some people had, did not know how to open bank accounts or write checks or balance their checkbook or or even engage in critical thinking what did you have to learn to do that's normal life for others <laughs> this is a long <laughs> I'll let you start <laughs> okay i'll start with having a having a social interaction with somebody social skills any kind of social skills yeah maintaining um, a relationship yes. picking up on social cues knowing if someone wants you to shut up <laughs> or if someone's like keep talking that's a big one you know just like okay what's happening right now <laughs> so and everybody's like okay looking at yeah. you weird and you're like i just <laughs> what said, did i do what? <laughs> i don't know what i said yeah, yeah. or sorry. like if a guy sits too close to me it's like, okay, is he coming on to me? Or yeah. is he just sitting close to me? Yeah. And like feeling That's uncomfortable, like That's... trying to pick up the social cues of like, <laughs> with, with just being a friend, being a normal 17, 18, 19 year old kid at high school, like this guy like does this. And I'm like, yeah. oh, we're getting married now. Because oh. <laughs> in the order, you don't hold hands yeah. until you're yeah, engaged. Yeah. You don't kiss till your wedding day. So it's like simplest touch mm -hmm. was so confusing so interpersonal relationships very difficult and mm -hmm. social skills very difficult i think that was the biggest one i had to learn i don't know about you but i had to learn how to open a bank account yeah. i had actually had somebody that i still kind of coached bank me. <laughs> yeah i had somebody kind of coach me for three months before i left because i was telling because i would go i signed up for a class and i started talking to the people there and they were like what you're saying is not normal you know that you're not normal right now. <laughs> and I started looking around and realizing, I am really not normal. And so I had them kind of guide me. Like, they helped me open a bank account. They talked to me about, you know, you're not supposed to date 27-year-old guys when you're 16. And, and apparently, I didn't know that. <laughs> In fact, my nickname was Jailbait because I didn't well, understand boundaries with well, older men. When you're, yeah, when you're in a polygamy group, mm -hmm. older, it's a normal, isn't it's it? A for a there's no boundaries whether they're yeah. married or not married. Exactly. And so being even adopted into a new family, even though he's now my dad, I was really careful to 
keep boundaries with even his his brothers. Yes. You would think that in a normal life, like that's my dad, mm -hmm. and those are his brothers. I don't that's have to worry never going to happen. <laughs> but in the order, that's who you marry. You marry your father's brothers, and so it's mm -hmm. like, even in this new world, I'm really like holding people at a distance. And it's hard because then they feel rejected by me. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you don't understand. I'm protecting you and me. Like, mm -hmm. this could be a really confusing relationship if we keep going there, you know? Yeah. I don't know how to put, like, the boundaries on unless we just put the wall up. Mm -hmm. way up and way that's very out. difficult to learn how to do. Mm -hmm. it, it, and I can vouch for that as well. Mm -hmm. What about welfare? Families in the group, are they mm -hmm. on welfare <laughs> because they don't have legitimate husbands or fathers to supply their needs? What? They teach you that if, as soon as you have your first baby, if you can, go get on welfare. Yes. That is the first thing they teach you. And that is, in fact, most of the girls, 16, 17, 18, they will go there and claim they don't know who their baby's daddy is, and they will all go get on welfare. Uh -huh. In fact, I worked for their grocery store for a couple of years before, I, not a couple of years, for actually about a year before I left. And, and this is the grocery store owned by the group, yes. the polygamy group, okay? Every, almost every mother, either they were on welfare, and if they couldn't get food on welfare... Food stamp welfare or WIC welfare? Both. WIC and Most of them stamp. were WIC, but a lot of them were food stamps. And if they didn't, in fact, I saw a little girl come in, and she was begging her mom to buy oats because they don't have food. And that little girl oh. is not going to eat unless her mom bought the oats. And I... We most kids beg for candy and yeah. chips, but that <laughs> one. Like, can we get the oats and potatoes and rice, please? Wow. <laughs> oh, how sad that we is. Dumpster we dumpster dived when yeah. we would beg my mom, like, can we please stop at Smith's and go and stop at the dumpster? The, in fact, we had a farm where we would beg our mom to go because they would actually have food, and it was the leftover stuff that they were going to throw it away to the pigs. Uh -huh. And so we'd say, Mom, can we please get there before they, before they throw the animals? Food? Yeah, exactly. Because wow. that was our good food. Now this should shock, this should shock our viewers. <laughs> the people that are watching our show tonight, sh this should be something, and, and the, the officials who refuse to believe there's anything wrong going inside a polygamy group, this should shock them into some, some kind of a reaction. I honestly this is wonder awful. how much even the dads know that's going on, because I remember when my dad was coming over, that's when we had the full meal. That's when we had the potatoes and the chicken and the vegetables, you know. Uh -huh, I've heard it that looked really too. nice. And yeah. I've confronted my dad about it, and he denied it up and down. And I denied what part? Everything. 